It was the most luxurious and valuable fabric of fiber known in the ancient world. And it was the most valuable luxury goods that was imported into the Roman Empire. It was so important that one of the biggest and most important trade routes in history was named after it. So what are we talking about today? Of course, it's silk, the most famous and most luxurious uh, fabric known to man. And of course, the best quality of which comes from China, as Chinese silk is valued all over the world, even today, for being the top quality fabric, the best quality fabric that man could find. So who discovered silk? How was it discovered? And what's the story behind this uh, highly prized uh, fabric? Hello and welcome to the Chain Smoking Writers channel, where we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people, from the first creation myth to the last imperial dynasty. More than 6,000 years of stories, one video at a time. So if you like content like this and videos like this, remember, subscribe and like the channel so you'll be notified whenever a new video drops. Now, it was said that in the ancient kingdom of Siling, during the hunter-gatherers uh, period in human history, there lived an old couple. And this couple had a daughter, a young and pretty daughter named Lei Feng. And since Lei Feng was their only offspring, it was pretty much impossible for them to go hunting. And so they relied you know, exclusively on Lei Feng to provide for them through gathering and scavenging for foods in the nearby uh, forests and hills. Now, Lei Feng was an extremely filial daughter and took great care of her parents. And every morning, early in the morning, she would go out to find food and find uh, sustenance for her, herself and her parents, her aged parents. And one day, she saw these uh, berries that was growing on a mulberry tree. Uh, these berries were red and bright and, um, you know, looks very appetizing and so she plucked some of them and she gave it a taste. Ah, however, it was sour and tannic and, you know, not very appetizing. So she just leave them be. A few days later, Lei Feng returned to the same spot and these previously bright red berries had turned black. And um, she was worried that it was poisonous. So, of course, she didn't dare to pluck them to give to her parents. However, there was nothing much else to be found in the surrounding areas. There was no other sources of food. And she got so anxious that her parents would go starving that she started sobbing uncontrollably uh, under the tree. Now, the big god king guy in the sky, uh, the Jade Emperor, we've mentioned him a few times before in other stories, well, he was there in his heavenly palace and he heard the sobs and the, the, the cries of uh, Lei Feng. And, you know, feeling sympathy for her and just so happened there was a deity around that was awaiting punishment. Um, the Jade Emperor ordered this deity to uh, descend to the earthly realms to aid Lei Feng, to give help to Lei Feng. Uh, this deity was named uh, Ma Tou Niang or Lady Horsehead. Yeah, what a name, right? Lady Horsehead. So as punishment for her transgressions in the heavenly realms, uh, we have no idea what those trans transgressions were. Um, Lady Horsehead or Ma Tou Niang was uh, sent down to the mortal realm to become an insect that uh, fed solely on mulberry leaves. So when Ma Tou Niang landed on a mulberry leaf uh, that was nearby to uh, Lei Feng, she purposely knocked over a few of the ripe uh, mulberries, the black mulberries that was growing on the tree, and they dropped to the ground. And seeing that there was not much other choice for food, Lei Feng uh, plucked up her courage and she ate one of these uh, berries. And instead of being sour and tannic, these berries are now, you know, sweet and juicy and extremely tasty and delicious. I mean, it was like really the total opposite of what she was expecting. And she happily gathered up all these berries as much as she could as she brought back to her parents. And these mulberries became a staple for herself and her parents. Now this went on for a while and uh, on one of her gathering trips where she was gathering berries, Lei Feng noticed that there were these white worm-like creatures that were on the trees and they were munching on the leaves of the mulberry trees. And you know, as they were munching, they were growing at the same time, at an alarming rate. And alongside these worms, there were these uh, little white bulbous things growing on the tree that looked like, you know, furry white fruits. 
So out of curiosity, Lei Feng uh, decided to pluck some of them and bring them home with her. And once she brought these uh, fruits home, um, both herself and her parents tried to eat them, you know. However, the, they could not break through the shell with their teeth and neither could they soften the texture of these fruits uh, by chewing and it was really pretty disgusting. And a neighbor that was walking past at this time, uh, seeing the disgusted, uh, you know, scrunch up look on their faces, uh, laughed at them and, uh, you know, jokingly tell them, yeah, you're eating weird stuff, you might as well throw them into a pot and boil them. Now, Lei Feng, being a rather stubborn girl, took it at face value, took what the neighbor said at face value, and she actually went out and found a big container and lit a fire under it and threw all these uh, furry white balls or furry white fruits uh, into the water and started boiling them. And after a while of boiling, um, thinking that, you know, it should be enough time have passed, uh, she scooped up some of them and tried to eat them again. And it was still as hard, it was still as disgusting, and it was still totally inedible. And, you know, in a fit of anger, Lei Feng took a stick and she started whacking on the fruit still in the pot that was still boiling and she started stirring it and cursing and swearing at it like for wasting her time and her effort for gathering all these uh, things which were practically useless at this time. So what happened was after a while of like you know cursing, swearing and beating and stirring the pot, um, she finally of course she finally tired herself out and she realized that all these uh, little fruit things have totally disappeared in the pot and instead what she found were like little strands little strands of fiber uh, stuck to this uh, stick she was using to stir the pot now not only were these fibers thinner and stronger than anything she or anyone had seen before uh, it was also smoother and um, she started to think about what can I do with this uh, thing what can I do with all this uh, fiber that that has now appeared in the pot. So um, she came up with a bright idea to start weaving them, you know, uh, into fabric. And out of this fabric, uh, she made clothes for her parents. It was a stroke of genius, you could say, in hindsight, because these uh, new clothes and this new fabric that she made were actually lighter and more comfortable than what they were wearing previously. On top of that, it had the effect of being cooling in the summers and uh, had the ability to keep the wearer warm in the colder months. Now this process sparked off an idea in Lei Feng's uh, head. You know, uh, so she went out and she caught as many of these little white worms as she could and she started uh, growing them at home, you know, cultivating these worms at home. And after a period of experimenting and uh, testing things out, she finally um, had a grasp of how to grow these worms and how to produce this a fiber that she needs to make a fabric. Having perfected the art of cultivating silkworms, yep, exactly, those were silkworms, and making fabric out of them, um, she decided to share this information and share these discoveries with the people around her. So with this new discovery and these new skills, the people of uh, the kingdom of Silin uh, transitioned from wearing uh, rough clothes uh, made from plant fibers or even animal hide and uh, furs uh, into wearing comfortable silk clothing. It would be incredible to imagine, I mean imagine this, uh, an entire prehistoric kingdom or settlement, you know, all decked out in the finest silk you can think of. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the king or the leader, the chieftain of uh, the sealing people was so happy with this uh, development that she, he took on um, Lei Feng as a ward, uh, thereby, in a way, making her a princess of the land. And the people, of course, were grateful uh, for uh, Lei Feng's uh, willingness to share her knowledge, her discoveries, and uh, her willingness to teach people her skills. And out of respect for her, uh, they started referring to her as Lei Zhu, or Mother Lei. The news of this discovery and um, the, the, the contributions of Lei Zhu uh, spread far and wide across the land and um, kings and chieftains and uh, you know, lords from across the land uh, came to see Lei to seek Lei Zhu's hand in marriage. And uh, as the story goes, none of them were successful. Now that was until this next guy turned up. 
Now, as the story goes, it was a bright and sunny day with nary a cloud in the skies, uh, where Huang Ti and his followers um, were traveling on their way to Si Ling uh, to seek out, you know, talents and mentors and people to join them in their cause. And it was at this time that came to a mulberry forest and a sphere white shadow was flitting between the mulberry trees in the forest. It was as if a fairy was dancing among the, the trees. And Huang Ti was captivated. He could not take his eyes off this fairy-like being. Now one of uh, Huang Ti's uh, followers, Chang Bo, uh, saw the look on Huang Ti's face and uh, yeah, that must be a sight to behold, right? Your boss going like all gaga over this lady he sees in the woods. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Chang Bo saw the look on Huang Ti's face and um, decided that he would approach this uh, lady in the woods and politely uh, ask her if she was the fame uh, Lei Zhu who discovered silk and taught the people how to make uh, fabric. Seeing that you know the party was well mannered and they spoke eloquently, uh, Lei Zhu said that yes, uh, I am uh, Lei Zhu, and she went on to um, openly share her knowledge and her discoveries with the party. Now, after hearing what Lei Zhu had to uh, share with them, Huang Ti was deeply impressed. You know, not only was this uh, lady extremely beautiful, she was extremely capable as well. How wonderful would it be if she could go back with us and you know spread her knowledge with our people? It would be a great benefit, you know, for our people to have such beautiful clothes to protect them from the elements. So having decided that he uh, would want Lei Zhu to go back with him to the settlement, uh, Huang Ti formally uh, introduced himself and uh, asked if Lei Zhu would uh, return with him to his tribe, to the Youxiong tribe. And uh, Lei Zhu actually readily agreed, you know, on the condition that she could bring her parents along with her. Now, this is what I think, you know, the whole Huang Ti inviting Lei Zhu back to the settlement with him. Yeah, I, I, I don't think his intentions were entirely altruistic. Yeah, he most probably has got something for Lei Zhu by this time. And Lei Zhu agreeing so readily after turning down the, 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 the request of the chiefs and the kings from all over the land. Yeah, I think she sees something in this, you know, young dashing leader of a tribe guy as well. So, yeah, I guess there's already something going on by this time. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the story. So, once back in the settlement of the Youxiong tribe or the Xuanyuan tribe, Huang Ti assembled all the chieftains and all his officials to listen to Lei Zhu share her discoveries. But uh, at this time, Lei Zhu just sat there on the altar and um, she didn't say a word. She just sat there quietly on the altar. Things were getting kind of awkward. I mean, you have all the chiefs of the region gathered and this lady sitting on the altar, not saying a single word, just sitting there quietly, minding her own business. Yeah, kind of awkward. So Chang Bo, being you know, the guy that is, I believe we can say he's pretty quick on his feet, he noticed something is wrong, so he went up to Lei, Lei Zhu and um, inquired about the, the, the issue, you know, to find out what's the problem, why is she not saying anything? And um, Lei Zhu, you know, discreetly told Chang Bo, she, she, she said to him, you know, quietly, you know, all the greatest leaders of the land are gathered here today, but who am I to address them? You know, I'm nothing but a common villager, a common village woman. Uh, who knows nothing, is not my place nor my station uh, to be lecturing the greatest man on the land. Now Chang Bo, you know, understood immediately the subtext of what uh, what's going on at this time. The way I imagine it would be that, you know, Lei Zhu agreed to come back with Huang Ti because she thought he would want to marry her. Uh, but now that she's back in the settlement, all he asked her to do was to, you know, give lectures and be a lecturer, a teacher to the people. So yeah, this lady is kind of throwing a tantrum. So Chang Bo, uh, as we mentioned earlier, being the quick-witted guy in the group, having understood the subtext and what's going on, um, decided that, yeah, you know what, I'll play matchmaker for once, man. And in front of the entire assembled court, he addressed Huang Ti, who is like the supreme lord commander of the land kind of thing, you know. And he, he, he addressed Huang Ti in front of everyone. He was like, my lord, you are already 30 years old, aren't you? 
Isn't it high time you have a queen by your side? Now Huang Di being like, you know, bewildered, like, where the hell did this come from? He, he, he pulled Chang Po to the side and asked like, Hey, why are you suddenly talking about my marital status in this uh, court assembly? And so Chang Po, you know, kind of discreetly in a roundabout way replied to his lord. He was like, well, my lord, uh, if you are not too bothered by Lei Zhu's uh, status as a commoner, I think I can convince the court and all the leaders to make her your queen. Now, Huang Di might be a great leader of men and, you know, be the supreme lord, commander, king of the land person. But, you know, like every or rather most men until today, he is not really good with women and 30 year old, no wife, no girlfriend. Yeah. Anyways, so Huang Di, you know, having heard what Chang Po said, he coyly replied, well, what has status and station got to do with anything? You know, all my queen needs is to bring warmth to the household and bring benefits to the people. Now, hearing the answer, uh, Chang Po, of course, has final confirmation that, you know, they both have interest in each other and they were just too shy to say anything. Chang Po addressed the court at this time and uh, told them told all the gathered chiefs and leaders about the discoveries and the achievements and the contributions that Lei Zhu has made to the people of um, Xiling. And he made a formal proposal in court for Huang Ti to take Lei Zhu as his queen uh, to rule the people, to rule the land together. And by this time, all the leaders and the chieftains of the land were so impressed by what they heard about Lei Zhu from uh, Chang Po that they actually uh, all agreed to the proposal and they urged Huang Ti to take Lei Zhu as his wife and to be the queen of the tribe. Now, in the midst of all this uh, cacophony, you know, um, Huang Ti snuck a look at the blushing Lei Zhu by this time. And, you know, hmm? uh, Lei Zhu, of course, was like, hmm. And of course, the matter was settled. Huang Ti agreed and, and uh, decided to take Lei Zhu as his wife. Now, with this uh, little side incident out of the way, uh, Lei Zhu finally started her lecture and shared with the gathered uh, leaders of men uh, uh, of her knowledge of silk and uh, the skills and the techniques needed to uh, fabricate these uh, fabrics and uh, cloth and clothes out of this uh, fiber. Now, when it came time to formalize their marriage, uh, Huang Ti, you know, being a man, wasn't too bothered about the details. Uh, to him, it was just a, a formality that should be just over and done with. Uh, while his uh, attendant, uh, Chang Po, the matchmaker, uh, relayed this idea to Lei Zhu, uh, she apparently had other ideas. Now, Lei Zhu felt that uh, marriage should not be entered into uh, haphazardly. There should be a a level of equality and a sense of mutual respect between the two parties getting married. And uh, very importantly, they should have a common vision or a goal that they will work towards together. And that, to her, would form the basis uh, of a happy and harmonious uh, family and marriage. She felt that as king or as chieftain of a people, Huang Ti should set an example uh, with his own marriage and uh, ceremony and vows. And after pondering upon the issue for a while, um, Lei Zhu came up with a set of vows and the manner of how the ceremony should be carried out. And Huang Ti, yeah, as usual, being the guy, didn't really have um, any opinion on the matter. Yeah, all you guys out there getting married, just, just say yes to whatever your future wife is saying, man. Huang Ti um, agreed with, with uh, Lei Zhu's proposal and uh, he actually believed that it would indeed set an example for harmonious families across the land. So on the day of the marriage itself, uh, Huang Ti and Lei Zhu conducted the ceremony on top of the ancestral mountain on the west side of the capital, uh, where they made eight vows, you know, uh, respectively to um, the heavens, the earth, the sun, the moon, the mountains, the rivers, the ancestors, and lastly, but most importantly, a vow to each other. Now, this ceremony and the vows uh, solemnize the couple's uh, commitment to each other for life. 
And if you will believe it, uh, the eight vows and the general form of the ceremony has survived largely unchanged. Really, largely unchanged until today. Uh, if you've uh, seen any uh, traditional Chinese marriages, the ceremony is basically the same. The vows are the same, the, the, the commitments and the promises are basically, I mean, if not in actual form, but in spirit, they are still the same all these thousands of years later. Now, after marriage, Lei Tzu was both a great help and a great aid to Huang Ti in the uh, the governing of the people and the development of the very fledgling uh, Chinese civilization or the civilization of the Huaxia people at that time. She implemented a few cultural changes and she made uh, some uh, improvements to the traditions and the living habits of the people so that the people has a better standard of living. Now, of course, Lei Zhu was highly respected for her discovery and contributions in terms of silk making and silk growing. She was uh, later deified as the goddess of silk or the guardian angel, the guardian deity of silk. Even today, we can find archaeological sites where Lei Tzu cultivated uh, silkworms and uh, it is believed that it is in uh, today's uh, Shanxi province in Huangling County. Lei Tzu passed away uh, from an illness uh, in her sunset years when she was on an inspection tour in the south with Huang Di. Um, before she passed away, she told Huang Ti and the attendants that she missed her home greatly and would like to be buried uh, back there after she was gone. So uh, it is believed that she is buried in the uh, current day Sichuan province in uh, Yanting County. Now I hope you enjoyed this uh, story and this uh, video and if you did, please remember to smash the like button and maybe subscribe to the channel. Now we move on to bonus facts. Now, the story about uh, Huang Ti and Lei Zhu's marriage, uh, I believe it's not so much about the marriage of two people. Of course, it was fun telling it to bashful young people getting married. Uh, however, on a more serious note, that story is most probably about the assimilation of the Siling people and the Huaxia people into one entity. So it is representative of uh, what we spoke of before in previous episodes about the Huasi are growing stronger over time by assimilating the various tribes and the clans into this uh, single entity. After the marriage of the Huasi and the Siling tribes, we can know that um, they of course absorb as well the technology of silk uh, production. By the same token, we can say the same of um, the time when the Shenong tribes were assimilated into the Huasi people as well. Uh, that is where they picked up the advanced agricultural techniques of the Shenong people. And then uh, we have the time where um, the Jiu Li people were defeated and the technology of bronze casting uh, transferred to the Huaxia people at this time. So you could say it was an amalgamation of all these technologies uh, within one single people, which led to a great leap in uh, advancements, both in terms of productivity and uh, societal changes. So all these monumental discoveries and um, technologies that uh, combine into one, basically drag the primitive peoples, I don't think they'll be screaming and kicking, but all these uh, discoveries drag the pseudo primitive people of this time uh, into what we'll call fledgling culture and civilization. And this was the first spark that sent the Chinese people down the road of development into one of the most dominant cultures in East Asia. Well, if you like this video and like this story, remember to smash the like button. And if you like content like this, remember to subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so that you'll get notified whenever a new video drops. And uh, if you'd like to support my work on Patreon or if you'd like to connect with me on other social media platforms, all the links are down below in the comment section and I would love to hear from you you know any feedback on anything that you want to talk about I would definitely get back to you when I see your comments down below so I guess uh, that's it for today and I will see you soon in the next episode